Welcome to the 23rd episode in our series, The Evolution of a Nation, a documentary series recounting Uganda's key political, economic, and social milestones, Ambat Kakoza. Now, in the previous episode, we saw how the Islamist extremist militants, the ADF, unleashed terror on Uganda that killed hundreds of innocent civilians before the country's security machinery moved in with a counter-offensive campaign that overwhelmed the militants sending them scampering for refuge in the DRC. In this episode, we take a look at yet another terror group, the Lord's Resistance Army of Joseph Coyne, that for close to two decades devastated northern Uganda, causing thousands of deaths, injuries, and massive displacement of people in the region, and how UPDF fought and defeated the rebel groups, forcing them to flee to the Central African Republic, from where they continue to cause mayhem. Thanks for joining us. Joseph Coyne. His name resounds the dreaded brutal Lord's Resistance Army, stretching back to the days when he was a child fighter in the disbanded Uganda People's Army Rebel Outfit. One among those who are not considered and included in the landmark Peche peace agreement with government. A lurking figure that later came to haunt not only northern Uganda, but also government. They left uh, uh, child soldiers like uh, Joseph Korn as non-entity, that they will die a national death. But they didn't. They didn't. You see? If those people were, all of them came get back together with the UPDA, there would have been no, no LRA. Believed among his followers to be possessed by mighty spiritual powers, he rode on the allure of spirituality to mobilize desperate sections of the population to join his rebel outfit. And at that point in time, he had also uh, people who were still fearful, thinking that we were going to be as NRA, a force that would exterminate the, the population in the north. He named his group the Lord's Resistance Army, and his clarion's call was to cleanse the population by making them adhere to the biblical Ten Commandments of God. He wanted to use the Bible so that people could follow him. Expectedly, the LRA targeted NRA through ambushes, which saw the resurgence of insecurity in the Acholi sub-region. Relying on reasonable support from some sections of the local population, LRA was able to make a foothold within their areas of operation. Some people were supporting him. He would get information where the army was and he would, sometimes they would ambush, they would get guns. Sometimes they would ambush, they would get guns because they were getting food. They were doing all that. Those who are called rebel collaborators. Although NRA marshaled all its human and logistical resources to mount a counterinsurgency drive against the LRA, sympathies drove some units within the NRA to respond with counterinsurgency strategies that played into the hands of the insurgents. There were commanders who uh, were on the front, on the side of the NRA, who were professional, who were disciplined, and also had skills of counterinsurgency warfare. But there were also elements within NRA, those who had a different uh, understanding of how to fight counterinsurgency and they caused a problem because when they carried out uh, operations and people died in the process now that played into the fears of the population 
And that was a very complicated situation to, to handle. And some commanders who, whose discipline either broke down because of the pressures of war, or who believed that uh, counterinsurgency cannot be won if you apply the hearts and minds uh, uh, strategy of winning over hearts and minds, mm -hmm. that you'd rather push militarily. It created a problem. Indeed, heavily relying on this approach was increasingly becoming counterproductive to the extent that political leaders who proposed the peaceful method were victimized and imprisoned. Can you imagine a man of the status of, of, of uh, Adimola, Andrew Adimola, Tiberio Kane, Zakaria Olum, and all these other people, prominent northerners, who was telling Museveni that, please, let us not just use military means to fight rebels. Let us talk to these rebels. There is a reason why they are fighting. Some of them were provoked. Now, the increasing voices appealing to government to consider a softer approach to end the insurgency eventually yielded response. Government gave a go-ahead to Minister for Pacification of Northern Uganda, Betty Bigombe, to make contacts with LRA and initiate talks. In 1991, after the military operation in Gulu, not in Kitgumia, in Gulu, Betty Bigombe initiated dialogue with Joseph Cohen. Then I was I was still the Dutchian secretary in Gulu of Northern Uganda. So Betty sent a message to me that you come on behalf of the church. I went and we used to go with her in the bush to talk to to the LRA. Between December 1993 and February 1994, Betty Bigombe led a peace negotiation team comprising representatives from Acholi elders, religious leaders, politicians and government. It is through this peaceful uh, approach that you can actually go to the underlying causes, the root of the problem, and as it were, uproot uh, the problem. Talks were held at Pajik, 25 kilometers north of Gulu town. During the talks, the LRA expressed willingness to return home as long as their early actions would be pardoned by government. But major rifts exacerbated by mutual suspicions arose within the negotiations, which led to the collapse of the peace process. It had gone very well, and some commanders were even now sleeping in a Choli Lodge. Uh, if I remember those who were like going, other commanders, most of them have already died. So the peace talks, uh, little did we know, uh, it was a tactics for LR to cross over into Sudan. And the purpose of going there was to go and get ammunition. So here we are talking in Gulo, the other side they are getting ammunition. So that was a clear sign that uh, the peace talk was not going to work. I think when it was known at strategic level, that is how uh, the leadership gave coin seven days to come out or to sign peace talks, which they could not accept because they had already established that relationship across the other side. So, following these developments, in February 1994, government gave a seven-day ultimatum to rebels to surrender or face a military defeat. That marked a major turning point in the tactics used by Lea Ray. Northern Uganda was yet to experience intensified severe LRA atrocities meted out on the local population. And they started uh, killing people in ambushes, all the roads leading out of, out of towns. So you could not go to Kampala, you could not go to Arua, you could not go to Madi, to Nimule, you could not come to Kitgum, you could not go to Lira. Or you could not go from here, decide or decide or anywhere, so long as roads. That is how they started. 
The LRA insurgency had entered one of its worst phases in which terror was unleashed on the population as a punitive form of warfare for not embracing the rebellion en masse. One of the LRA's most notorious brutal attacks happened on the April 20th, 1995, here at a Tiak Trading Center in the current Amuru district. The attack that was commanded by Vicente T, who hailed from the same area, is reported to have massacred between 200 and 300 people, including men, women and children. Among those were 48 students and two teachers of a Tiak Technical School. The incident marked a beginning of LRA mass atrocities in northern Uganda that prompted government to sever relations with Sudan, which it blamed for supporting the rebels. This renewed attack was boosted by a cache of weapons that LRA had stockpiled during the 1994 peace talks. By that time, we had uh, a Sudan embassy here in Kampala and a consulate in Golo. I think there was coordination during that peace talks between the Los Isanami and the consulate in Gulo. Uh, that was the time Joseph Kony started sending his groups into South Sudan. Here in Gulo, peace talk was going on, but towards the border of Palabek, another group was going into Sudan. And I was the Brigade Tayo in Kitigum, and that's how I detected that uh, there was something crossing the border going to South Sudan. The LRA war took a new dimension with the introduction of land mines and anti-personnel mines dimension. Although they were meant to impede movement and detection of LRA activities, the civilians' population bore the brunt. Many unwittingly stepped on the explosive devices and lost their lives, while the survivors lost their limbs. Uh, this thing which happened to, to me is a very, very, very sad thing and very painful to me when I talk about because I just went to harvest my bananas from my own plantation when I fell victim to this landmine. Uh, this station we are seeing now lost its uh, left leg in a, a blast. That was a foot mine. LRA made a surveillance of the population whom they accused of collaborating with UPDF or reporting their hideouts. They used brutal methods like chopping limbs, cutting off ears and lips, these vicious acts usually followed manhunt operations by UPDF that resulted into losses on the side of LRA. The resident district commissioner in, in Gulu, I think he introduced what they call our boys. And then the LRA reacted very badly. If they find you, they cut off your fingers so that you don't hold the the arrows and the and the bows, so that, and then uh, they say the people tell, tell then they cut your lips, and then uh, they they cut the legs. If you are riding with a bicycle, they can cut your legs so that you have no way. So that is how uh, this uh, mutilation of limbs started in northern Uganda. So many people lost their limbs, ears, nose, lips, hands, arm, legs. And then uh, sometimes when you are found maybe uh, digging, doing something, they tell you from the two arms you select one and then they cut it off. So the whole thing was meant to deter the population from reporting them. The growing unpopularity of the LRA and its methods of warfare mainly meant to instill fear among the population became counterproductive such that recruitment proved very difficult. With the sustained effort of the NRA on the ground, more or less using those who are using the uh, Hudson Mines strategy, winning over Hudson Mines, people started recognizing that, okay, there are mistakes being made, but there's no intention of wiping out the population. But on the side of Kony, the methods of Kony were also exposing what he was all about. Initially, he was getting uh, voluntary recruits. 
he started running out of those who would be joining him voluntarily. While the population didn't support the regime, but that they could coexist with the NRA. Now, that caused a complication for Kony, because when he, the population ceased to join him voluntarily, he started forceful recruitment started abducting civilians. Because of their innocence and the fact that they could be easily indoctrinated, children were targeted. At the height of the insurgency, the marauding rebels ransacked villages in northern Uganda and children were kidnapped in thousands, walked to the LRA bases in Sudan where they were conscripted into their ranks. The LRA has been targeting the children abducting children, training children to come and abduct fellow children, to come and kill fellow children. In order to avoid abduction of their children, families would flee the villages every evening and seek protection in towns and places that were closer to military detaches where they would spend a night. This phenomenon, which came to be known as night commuting, was not only perilous, but children were subjected a hard life of sleeping rough on verandas and in squalid overcrowded buildings. Neglecting them to be damaged by bad weather and then again being exposed to danger of death, being exposed to even evil life, others defiling them, you know, all this. They were saying basically three things. One, rebels why do you target us? Abduct us? Make us into soldiers? Make us do killings which we are not prepared for? We are not meant for that? Two, they were asking the government, why don't you protect us? We continually are being abducted. Why don't you have anything to do about us, our case? And number three, they were challenging the institutions of the world who are particularly to care for children. Say, what are you doing outside there? We are suffering here. Why don't you come and rescue our situation? By late 1990s, the outcry of the population about the deteriorating security situation reached a deafening crescendo when a percentage of the population fled villages and sought refuge in trading centers. These settlements, which came to be known as IDPs, were subsequently formalized by government and offered protection by the UPDF. This is Palenga, the largest IDP at the height of the LRA insurgency. It accommodated close to 60,000 people seeking refuge from the marauding rebels that had made it impossible for them not only to stay in their homes, but also to tend their gardens. So when IDPs were now gazetted. Definitely it cut off LR from so many things. Number one, they were not able now to abduct children because abducting children means you have to come and fight with the UPDF which was now guarding the IDPs and then two, information was not, they were not getting it. So they also cut off from the information. And then number three, people used to cultivate everywhere so food was in abundance. And now when people were in the IDPs and they were being fed by the government, it was not easy even for them to sustain their fighters. The hastily set up shelters were characterized by congestion, extreme poor sanitation, and lack of services like schools and health facilities. Government, in collaboration with some international relief organizations, mobilized resources to address the desperate conditions in the camps. In total, close to 1,400,000 people are estimated to have lived in 249 IDP camps when the LRA activities hit their peak. In 1998, Al-Qaeda militants bombed the U.S. embassies in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. Their links to the Sudan came under more scrutiny, prompting the United States to consider including it on the list of countries that sponsor terrorism. Uganda, which had for a long time accused Sudan of sponsoring the Lord's Resistance Army, 
demanded access to Sudanese territory to verify if indeed the LRA had rare bases here. They caved in under international pressure. Uh, there was a lot of pressure and uh, it, had, it had to agree to talk to us so that we could at least solve that problem once and for all, especially considering the fact that uh, uh, the SPRA negotiations were also taking place. So we had a negotiations with the government of uh, Sudan uh, and came up with an agreement that uh, uh, indicated where our forces could operate. We had a red line where we were not supposed to cross, but at least we were allowed to move into Sudan up to a certain area. Following this mandate in 2002, 15,000 UPDF soldiers backed by artillery, tanks and attack helicopters moved into Sudan in a procedure codenamed Operation Iron Fist. The massive operation was successful in dismantling LRA's camps and rescuing LRA abductees, most of whom were found in deplorable state. And were able to disperse the LRA from all the bases that were close to our border. The intensified offensive against the rebels provided an opportunity for many LRA fighters to escape and report to the various government offices and took advantage of the Amnesty Act, which provided for all fighters who took up arms to fight government between 1986 would be received, pardoned, processed and reintegrated into society. The Uganda government passed a bill in parliament of a blanket amnesty. So anybody who left the LRA before me had been granted that. So why should they fear? The bulk of LRAs who are coming back are children, are young people. We have we ought to make them productive members of the community. If you don't do that, they'll turn into violence. So even if it's not rebel activities, there will be insecurity in the area unless uh, government or we find them some means of livelihood that they have to be earning a living. And those who can go to school, they need to go to school. Now, having lost their bases inside the Sudan, the LRA retreated back into northern Uganda in a desperate attempt to prove that they were not yet defeated and still lethal, they carried out a renewed spate of terror, mainly targeting the defenseless population. They spread their activities from Acholi sub-region all the way through Lango to parts of Teso. This is Balonyo IDP camp on the aftermath of the LRA attack. On 21st February 2004, a group of LRA led by Odiambo, estimated to have been 70, attacked this IDP camp in Ogulsab County, 26 kilometers north of Lira town. The camp had a population of 4,000 people, of whom 150 were massacred during the attack. Houses were set ablaze together with their occupants inside. This was the largest massacre committed by LRA outside of Acholi sub-region. Opota Trading Center at Konagang Pa Achulu, Amot Sub County, is the site where 27 people lost their lives in the brutal and dehumanizing manner on October 23, 2002, when an estimated 44 fighters of the Lord's Resistance Army raided the area. They murdered people, cut them in two pieces, and then hooked them in pots in the presence of dozens of witnesses. Some of the names are written in red. Those are the categories whose limbs were cut and cooked in the pot in the middle of the road in this trading center. This one called Okela Tuol, his liver was removed. His, they, they cut the, 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 the stomach and they removed the liver. This one, Okidi Joseph Doctor, his head was cut and the tongue was even put, pulled out, cooked in the pot with the intention that the survivors should eat. The outcry against the LRA atrocities had attained international dimensions to the extent that ICC indicted Joseph Coyne and the LRA top five commanders on seven counts of war crimes and crimes against humanity. With the ICC indictment, the elusive LRA commander, 
Joseph Cohen, already hiding, became even more isolated and restricted in his activities. By 2006, UPDF intensified operations against the LRA, which led to a number of losses of LRA commanders and many rebels. When they were finally defeated in eastern Uganda, and the northern Uganda, that's when they crossed finally, and they did not this time go to South Sudan, because they knew that we had the capacity to operate from there, they instead moved to the Democratic Republic of Congo, into a place called Galamba, where they established their bases, and that's the time they were also pushing for what they were calling the peace talks, because they had been under pressure, and they thought that they would get soft landing. <laughs> very good. Nice to meet Thank you. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. I'm glad to see you. Yeah, At the time, a comprehensive peace agreement had been signed between SPLA and the government of the Sudan, and Riek Mashar, then a senior member of government of South Sudan, facilitated the peace talks process. You made us? That propaganda, that Kony is a terrorist. Despite years of terrorizing the population of northern Uganda, the government of Uganda was even then willing to explore peaceful options, if only it would lead to the end of the LRA insurgency. We had to talk to them because the National Resistance Movement believes first and foremost in resolving problems by discussion. A delegation led by the Prime Minister, Rakana Rugunda, represented Uganda in the negotiations which led to the drafting of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. Joseph Cohn did not present himself for the final signing. The peace talks actually were very successful, except that Cohn did not come to initial the agreement, which we, the two delegations, had already uh, initial and signed, but we wanted him and uh, President Yoweri Museveni uh, to initial and sign and formalize. President Yoweri Museveni went to Juba to sign the agreement, but Coin, contrary to what he had promised, never appeared at Likwamba to sign the agreement. After the collapse of the Garamba peace talks, the UPDF launched Operation Lightning Thunder on December 14, 2008, using air and ground troops to flush out the LRA from the Garamba National Park in the DRC. Two years later, the LRA retreated even further into hiding by crossing into the Central African Republic. In 2010, the United States joined the Konyman Hunt by sending 150 U.S. Special Forces to support the UPDF in the Central African Republic. In 2012, the regional governments, including the DRC, South Sudan, and Central African Republic, agreed to form a regional task force under the African Union to fight the LRA, though only Uganda remained with troops on the ground. By 2017, the United States and UPDF decided to end the joint operation in Central African Republic. The LRA is deemed a spent force, incapable of posing a big threat to Uganda. I don't think Cohen will come to fight in Uganda. Um, the reason is that, one, he doesn't have the forces. That's number one. He can't use foreigners to come and fight Uganda. And then, two, it's very far now from South Darfur to Central African Republic, DRC, West Nile, then you cross the river, where you, where you will begin from the West Nile, coming back to the Middle North. It's not going practically, it's not going to be possible. Uh, he keeps losing fighters day by day. They are being killed by the rebels of Central African Republic, wild animals in the process to when they're moving the parks. Kony himself is a big threat. When I left, he had killed five women. So he's very hostile, and he has killed quite a number of his fighters. And even those commanders you hear, they are there. Today, they are old. Mm. They're in the 50s and 60s. You can't run up and down again today. Even his own, own health, his health is not good. He's diabetic. There was a time when they were carrying him on stretcher for about three days. Kony is not a threat. Unless maybe he wants to come and surrender or to go to another country. But to say coin come and going to be very active like those days, it's a dream. At least I saw it started in 1987. Up to 2016 when I left him there, 
So I know, and I started fighting when I was a private, I left there when I was a brigadier. So I know where we are coming from. It's not possible. It is estimated that the LRA has been reduced to about 200 in number. Many of the top LRA commanders, including Vincent T, have died. Others, like Moses Ongwen, have been captured and handed over to the ICC to face trial for their crimes. Today, Northern Uganda is peaceful, healing from the wounds inflicted on the population by the 20-year-old devastating insurgency. In our next episode, we shall take a look at Uganda's economy in the 1990s, specifically the effect of liberal economic policy, components of which included privatization of public enterprises and attraction of direct foreign investment. Until then, thanks for watching. Le, 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 le. Le, 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 le.